You're listening to a Brain Stew Fresh Fright Review. What's up, creeps? And welcome to a brand new Epic Film Guys Fresh Fright Review. I'm Justin. I'm Jeremy. I'm a B-Ratty. And tonight, we yeah. have a very special episode for you. You said that really sexually. But, like, well, he did. Just kinda, Are you trying to like lure I'm, them in? I'm Are you trying to be seductive? Kind. I don't have to try to be seductive. I just am seductive. Um, I really think it's the cutoff shirt. You think so? I, no, I don't think so. Anyways, uh, before we get started with the episode... Braddy's you know, wearing an affliction and shirt, and he's really he's really feeling himself. I went to Kohl's, and I said I want the affliction shirt, brother. Actually, you're wearing a nice nine kill shirt, which would signify that you're like a 13-year-old girl. What the fuck does that mean? Nothing. Nothing. Do you know who Ice Nine Kills is? Yeah, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I do. They're my I life, do, and I see, Justin. They're and my I, life. I see all of the 12-year-old girls at the Hot Topic, the local Hot Topic, wearing their shirts. Okay, well, I'm hip. Anyways, so... <laughs> before we get started on our review, which we will talk about in a minute. And Eventually. Announce, I think we should talk about a brand new trailer that dropped for David Gordon Green's new masterpiece, the Exorcist Believer. It's bound to be the new biggest box office hit this October. It's bound to be considered one of the best horror remakes slash reboot slash requel slash whatever the fuck it is of all time. I mean, I think it's a masterpiece already, but I want to hear from Even you though guys. you haven't seen I, it. Before, I'll say that before Righteous, I Righteous Gemstones is a masterpiece, so I'm going to go ahead and throw that out there. That he's he's got yeah. some win. He's got some win under his belt, and he's Halloween 2018 is a great Halloween movie. Yeah, sure. But what do you think, Jeremy, about uh, Exorcist Believer based on the trailer? Because we all saw it last weekend. We all went to the movies. We all saw it. Yeah, I was uh, I was anxiously anticipating seeing this trailer. Like I was, I mean, just like when the submarine thing happened with Ocean Gate. Uh, like I kept refreshing mm-hmm. my internet. Like, yo, did they find those fucking people yet? That's kind of what I was doing. That's like a fu- oh, that's like a them. fucked up analogy. Uh, but I'm like, that's <laughs> that's like I was invested. You know what I mean? So I kept refreshing YouTube. I'm like, when is this fucking trailer dropping? Because I I was legitimately curious and also hopeful. Like I I did, obviously did not love you know the last two movies that he made, but this one I was like, you know, right. I want to see what he does, especially because like, dude. He's got the internet. He knows what fans fucking said about him after the the most recent Halloween movies. You know? Yeah. Fans are fucking throwing eggs at his house while the studio is sucking his dick because of the amount of money that those movies made. So it's like, which one is is what you would prefer as an artist? You know what I mean? Um, Who knows? Mm -hmm. But um, I was excited for it. Uh, Optimistic, I would say. And, man, it just looks like the most mediocre phoned in thing ever. Like, and I got to tell you, man, the part that they chose to put in the trailer with the body and the blood, the body and the blood. And it's like, it was so ridiculous and not impactful and not effective at all that like they did all those weird camera cuts where it was like zooming in on her face and splicing different camera angles together. The body and the blood. Like, dude, it it was awful, cringeworthy. Yeah, I, I I dig the fact that there's two chicks that are possessed, and I dig that they're kind of linked to each other. I I love the fact that it's like they disappear, and they were just like, okay, or like, our, did our kids get abducted? And all of a sudden, they turn back up, and it's like, how long do you think that you were gone? A couple hours? You were gone for three days. I thought that was really cool, but like. <laughs> I laughed. I know. I kind of. I kind of. I kind of. I dug that, dude. I, I was like, you know, I, I really dig that. But like, I don't know, man. It it just it didn't really look like horror film either. Like, 
I think maybe you yeah. said, Justin, that it looked like it could have been like a like a Folgers commercial or some shit like that. Yeah, it looked like, like it looked like it looked like a fucking car commercial or something else. It looked too slick. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Gordon Green is known for that style, but to me, nothing about it at all uh, permeated the vibe of being an Exorcist movie at all. And I and I think it needed a, a little more of a gritty look to it. I know, of course, that he's going to sh- shoot it on digital and everything, but it really could have benefited from going old school, shooting it on yeah. film. Uh, the cinematography, again, looks just so modern. Like, everything about it just, it, it looked like, much like you said, Jeremy, every other possession movie we've seen since The Exorcist, j- just The Exorcist name and the theme slapped on it, and hey, a returning legacy character. Like, that's not a surprise. Um you know, it just it, it just fucking screamed try hard to me, and it's very unfortunate. A lot of people called me out when I when I mentioned my thoughts on this on the socials, and you know, well, you didn't like the last two of his Halloween movies. That's true. They suck. I d- I didn't, but at the same time, that doesn't mean I'm not going to give an open <laughs> opportunity to another one of his movies, in which I'm going to. I'm I'm very excited to see what they do with it. Um, but what I get from the trailer, at least, uh, you know, and, and knowing what we've heard, you know, we talked a few months ago about the test screenings. I have actually spoken to a few people personally that were at some of those test screenings, and they relayed to me that the movie is in trouble. And you know what? Blumhouse probably doesn't care because they know they're going to make a gonna shitload make money. of money off it regardless yeah. if it's good or not. Like, they don't care about Rotten Tomatoes or anything like that. They just want to make a lot of money off the brand, the IP. That's what they did with Halloween. That's what their, their you know, their way of making movies is. And Jason Blum is a smart guy. I mean, just walking out of the theater after seeing the trailer. Mind you, I saw it with Oppenheimer. Really interesting choice. Yeah. And there were intentional laughs during the trailer from the audience that was there to see Oppenheimer. So that, to me, made me realize, like, I don't think this... It, it, the movie's in trouble. Brady? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. When I watched the trailer, all I could think of was uh, Villanueva's Prisoners. Like, that's the same vibe it, vibe it gave me. And for me, it's like, cool. But that's, that's a good movie. It's a good movie, but that's a drama thriller. That's not a horror. And, like, that's not an exorcist film. So watching this, I was in the same boat where I was like, well, it doesn't feel like an exorcist film like it feels like a film about an exorcism or a possession or whatever you want to call it that we've gotten in the past 10 20 years or anything that the original exorcist has spawned but it just it it felt slick it felt very um like not over the top but just very like right like on the head of what david gordon green thinks the exorcist should be and what he wants to do with it and it just feels like halloween 2018 all over like we've talked about it on the podcast like we all love halloween 2018 i think we can all agree that he did really great with that movie but what do we expect after that like i don't think that he has three good movies in a franchise in him i don't i don't know i don't know if he has one good one I mean, well, Halloween 2018. I, 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 I'll, we, I think we can all give him that one, but I. Don't. I, I mean, I'm saying in terms of The Exorcist, oh, I, I don't yeah, know yeah. if he has one good one in him. I mean, again, I, I interesting ideas on display, and I think it's, um, I think it's two different types of movies too. Like, sure, with Halloween, like you've had so many movies come out where you can retcon, you can do this and that, like it, so you can kind of make it your own and say, all right, well, we're going to go back to the original or we're going to go back to the second one or we're going to do the Thorn trilogy, whatever you want to do. I don't think that same applies to The Exorcist. It doesn't. And a Halloween movie is much easier to make. And that's why there's been a whole shitload more of them than there has been Exorcist movies. But uh, again, the whole thing just reeks to me of... You know, we all we, we already know that he got the job based on the success, how much money and the made. money Blumhouse yeah. made oh, off sure. of the Halloween movies. It was so, hey, we bought the you know, rights to this. Like, oh. Do you want to do that thing again where we both make a shit ton of money? Yeah, okay. Which you can't fault them. Like if they say, "Hey, man, you made this much money for the studio. Let's just give you the rights." Well, to I mean, this. you you say that, Brady. I mean, a, a million fucking fans on the internet will tell you otherwise, but I don't necessarily disagree it's called, with you. It's called um, show business. It's a business, yeah, and yeah, every yeah, business yeah. is there and designed to make money. So here's a guy that made literally almost a billion dollars. Because I looked up at uh, how much money the uh, Halloween movies made, and it was 
almost a billion dollars. Insane. Yeah. So yeah. it's like this guy made us almost a billion dollars off of, you know, whatever the budgets were. Let's do that again. We we bought the rights to the Exorcist, man. Do that. Do that hat trick again. Make us a shit ton of money. So I get it, and I get why they chose him. And I mean, he brought Christopher Nelson along again for the ride, and he did all the special effects for uh, the most recent Halloween and I'm trilogy. Sure- yeah, I'm sure all the effects. Oh, dude, will be it'll be amazing. amazing. They they look at all concerned dude, with that. Another piece of imagery that I really loved from the trailer. So like, I'm not here just to, sh- to shit on it, right? Like, an- there was enough in the trailer that I did did like, and I thought that there were some great ideas, um, while also looking very mediocre in other parts. But like the part uh, with the two girls where they're like back to back, but looking up, and like there's all these silhouettes, and it looks like they're in a pentagram, um, and they're going drip, drip drip and they were like mm, and then yeah, ellen yeah, bernstein's yeah. fucking 157 year old ass is like that's going to the same heartbeat <laughs> as evelyn or whatever the fuck it is um i did that imagery looked cool as fuck and it looked creepy as shit so i think we're gonna be in for a mixed bag i think there's gonna be some things that are really original that's in it and i feel like there's gonna be a lot of it that's like all right well we've seen this a thousand times in other exorcist uh themed movies um and I may have said this in a previous podcast, but, like, there's a couple movies that were literally just of their time. They were lightning in a bottle, and you can't replicate them. Jaws is one of them. Exorcist is yeah. another one of them. Like, it doesn't matter who you hire to do it. You're just not going to capture what made those first movies great. You may make entertaining movies, absolutely, but they're never going to hold a candle to the original. And... Us horror fans, we're fucking suckers, man. Uh, you know, I'm guilty myself. Uh, you know, every franchise or, you know, movie that comes out, it's like, I'm I'm there because I, I love the original and I want to give this a fair shot. And more than, than not, we're disappointed and we're let down. And at best, we're like, that was fun. So I'm just hoping that this movie is going to be fun. Yeah, and I think to your point too, like, I think I speak for all of us on this podcast when I say none of us want this movie to fail. None of us are going into this saying, like, we hope this movie sucks. Like, it's just given his history of filmmaking in the horror community, we have an idea of where it's going to go. But, like, I want this to succeed. I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that I go to that. Dude, I'd be theater. I'd be all about yeah. I'd be all about three new great actresses movies. And I even, you know, went along the lines of this. <clears throat> talking to someone recently i said there is a way for a good exorcist movie to be made i don't think necessarily it's going to be by david gordon green but i think with the right people behind it there could be like much like jeremy said nothing that's going to come close to the original but something that was still entertaining still good still a well-made film yeah We'll, we'll we'll have to see i mean we'll definitely be seeing it early if they are planning on screening it for press, yeah. I, I have a feeling they may not be, but we'll we'll have to see what happens. We'll see if it's actually going to stay in its October release date. I don't I don't know if that's actually going to happen now. Um, but moving forward to something that we actually can champion mm-hmm. right now that just came out last weekend in theaters from A24. Talk to me from two twins from yeah. Australia that started their career on YouTube by doing YouTube videos, which are extremely impressive. They're not necessarily my thing, but they are impressive. And God damn it, if this was not one of the best directorial Ooh. debuts to the big screen that I've ever fucking Ooh. seen, we are talking about Talk To Me, A24's second biggest box office opening weekend ever, only behind Hereditary. Based on word of mouth, not an IP not a sequel, not a requel, none of that fucking shit, just an original horror movie with a tiny budget, $4.5 million, it already made $11.1 million as of this recording. God, this is really something to be celebrating, I think. No, for sure. Talk to me like lovers do. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I gotta admit, I guess I'll start with initial thoughts. You know, I... Well, don't, don't don't forget. Oh, my if, job. If our, uh, yeah. Do yeah, your fucking yeah, job, know, you motherfucker. If they don't know. Do your job. So, hey, do your, do your job. fucking job, you fucking hack. Do your job. Right. Bum right. fuck. S- simmer down. 
Uh, Get the fuck out of here. The synopsis is that when a group of friends discovers how to conjure spirits by using an embalmed hand, they become hooked on the new thrill until one of them unleashes terrifying supernatural forces. Written and directed by twins Michael and Danny Philippou, uh, Australian born directors and writers. Um, Like Justin said, they have a YouTube channel. They also worked on The Babadook um, as crew. So they're not unfamiliar to horror, but this is their debut. Uh, Going into it, you know, I really didn't have a lot of expectations when I first saw the trailer. To me, it seemed more of like another standard possession film involving teenagers and this overarching theme of grief that's flooded the genre as we've talked over the past five episodes or so. Um, But then there seemed to be a lot of praise coming out of the screenings. And I talked to Justin and Jeremy about it too. um, And it sounded like it was going to be more than just your average run-of-the-mill horror movie. Um, And then going into the movie, my initial reaction was that it just fucking grabbed me and it never let go. You know, like I don't know the last movie that made me wince or shift in my seat because of how uncomfortable and scared it actually made me. And I don't think since Hereditary that I've witnessed such a visceral display of horror so expertly crafted and tightly written. And that's how I left the theater and like haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Jeremy, what what do you think? Oh, man. Um, so I watched the trailer one time, and I still was just like, ah, I don't know how this one's going to play out for me. Um, I, I haven't read up. A bunch on it or anything I kind of almost went into it blind and and hearing you do the synopsis is crazy because in the movie you know they do suggest that they have a theory about what the hand is but I didn't know that mm-hmm. that I guess that that's fact that it's an embalmed hand because it's kids talking and they're just like oh, like what is it and it's like well I don't know like some people say that well it's yeah it's a real hand it's underneath a yeah, yeah yeah so I I, I kind of <laughs> just took that as like well you never really know what it is. So that's, that's pretty wild hearing that it's an actual embalmed hand. So I didn't know that was actually part of the, well, of the storyline. If I can, if I can cut you off real quick, like there's a story behind that. Cause I was, I've been reading a shit ton of interviews with the directors, Mm. uh, because like, it's just, it's fascinating to me when people come out of nowhere. Right. Mm. And like, you have an original script, an original story that hits us like this one did. And when they were talking, one of the directors, Danny, he said the embalmed hand comes from when he was in an accident, like a car accident, when he was 16 years old. And he split his face open. They thought he broke his spine. It was it was pretty bad. Um, and he said that while he was in the hospital, no amount of blankets or heaters or food or anything could stop him from just, like, shaking uncontrollably. Like, the doctors couldn't figure out what was happening. They ended up thinking, like, is it shock? Is it something that his body's doing? But that when his sister came and sat beside him and held his hand, that was the only thing that stopped him from shaking the entire time he was in there. And for him, it created this really strong image of human connection that comes from a hand. And so they have two separate scripts that came out. So they had an original script that they wrote and submitted, and then them and the producers said, this is going to be way too, like, gory, way too bloodthirsty, way too splatter film is how they describe it, and they wanted to kind of tone it back. Uh, and But the hand stayed, and so the embalmed hand came out in the second script, and they said, this is exactly what we need for it. So it, it I, I just wanted to throw yeah, it out dude, there. Yeah, dude, it's... Because you, you were talking about it's that. It's so... Ori- the, the whole premise of this movie is so original. Um, It's so brand new. Like, it's unlike anything that I've seen in a film before, honestly, uh, as far as the plot of this movie. Um, So I went and saw it with my buddy Ian um, and with my buddy Brian. And again, I had no real expectations other than I heard it was getting positive word of mouth. So I'm like, cool, this this might Mm -hmm. be something. So, dude, it was such a fucking wild experience seeing this movie in theaters, man. Like, I literally, I don't think there has ever been a time where I've watched a movie in the theater where I was moving around in my seat. I was, there was one point I literally put my hands over my eyes, like subconsciously. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, like, my hands are over my eyes. Like, 
Jeremy, you did the same thing that Danielle did when she was sitting next to dude, me watching the movie, and I can't fucking dude, believe it. it. You did it. I was squirming around in my seat. I was literally going, oh, oh, man. oh. like, yep, dude, exactly. It it is so brutal, but not in an over the top way. It, but it's so brutal, and it is unrelenting, and it doesn't give a fuck about how that makes you feel. Um, it was an unbelievable horror experience, man. Like I legitimately had such a great time with it and it really, you know, uh, one of my buddies, Rob G, um, posted that it made him feel what a nightmare on Elm street made him feel when he was a kid. And Mm. I honestly, I'm like, dude, yeah, absolutely. Because It made me uncomfortable. It made me squirm. There were points of this movie where I was legitimately terrified. Because I was invested in these characters. That's another thing that this directing duo did fantastically. Is like, I gave a shit about these characters. Um, Yeah, well, well, we can... Definitely get back to the characters, man, because like I, I have a lot to say about that, given I'm the person on the podcast who always says that I need more. Uh, but, Justin, before we get into characters, like coming out of the theater, like what did you think? Were, was it the same as me and Jeremy, where like you kind of went into it not knowing a lot and like just heard word of mouth? Yeah, I heard word of mouth immediately. Um, I, you guys aren't on the Twitter sphere, which is fortunate is for you. Uh, I don't give a fuck what they call it. <laughs> Myself and Joe from Movie Dumpster said the same thing. Like, you know, it, it's it, it, who gives a fuck what it's called? It's the same shit. Tweet, post, you're still going to release the same content and spew the same shit. Um, but, it, you know, the, the reality is, you know, what we do, we see movies early, this, this, and that, and we got to attend. Uh, you couldn't make it, but I got to see an early showing of the movie. And yeah, I mean, there was decent word of mouth up until the point when I saw it, but when I watched the movie, I had not low expectations, but probably just like mid-level that I have for anything that I don't really know what I'm getting into. And the movie fucking blew me out of my seat. Absolutely just, I mean, you know, I said this to you, Jeremy, via text. The movie holds right up next to It Follows and Hereditary as the last few horror movies that really challenged me and really, like Brady, you said earlier, like my initial tweet about the movie, it, it it pulled me in, it held me fucking tight, it would not let me go until after I left the theater. Then even then, I could not stop thinking about the movie for I days. I still am. And I can't wait to watch it yeah. again. I yeah. really can't. It, it just, it just, it, it inhabited me. It, much like what you see happening in the movie with these kids, which there's so many social themes and, and, and topical things here when it comes to social media and like I liken it to the it's no longer an Ouija board, but like kids TikToking and videoing people being possessed, yeah. like right in front of their eyes and not even necessarily being impressed by it, but just like having fun and laughing at each other while they're doing it. You know, it, it, it honestly even likened to a few years ago when kids were eating Tide Pods. Like <laughs> the shit that kids yeah. are doing now. Uh, for recognition and uh, reconnection within the algorithm of the world that we live in, it really just hit hard, but it didn't annoy me. Um, what did annoy me, and I have to make sure I make this very clear, um, Jeremy, the screening that we went to, we had press available, like we had a press area available, but they let regular people into the screening, and I'm not being a snob. I'm not being Alamo. <laughs> regular people. Happened, they let the regular people. Regular. You see people, this green hair? <laughs> that means I'm better they, than you. That is. That is regular, motherfucker. Um, what happened is a bunch of teenagers came in 15, 30 minutes late, 45 minutes late. I actually witnessed this firsthand, and it's an hour and a half ha- long movie. What did they come into, dude? Kids were filming. The movie with Flash on. They were taking photos of the movie with Flash on. They were talking to each other during the movie out loud, like regular volume. They were sitting and looking at their phones with the brightness all the way up. And it, I was really angry, but then I watched the movie and I was like, the movie is connecting with them and they're still on their phones. This is the audience that it's meant for. It, it's not necessarily meant for me as much as it is for them. 
mm-hmm. and it still worked for them. And when the, the movie ended and they were leaving, they were all laughing and joyous and, and you know, hollering about how great the movie was. I guess that's how kids today know. watch movies. But Weird. I mean, I was pretty appalled by what I saw. But Brady, like you were going to move on well, to the r- character. R- real, quick, real quick, real quick before I, you I, do that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So like literally during the movie, uh, after one of the uh, the first sessions with our core characters where, uh, you know, they, they do the talk to me game. My buddy Brian goes, I would I would have never done that. And I looked at him and I was like, I yeah, absolutely would have done that. And it made me think back to when I was roughly that age. And maybe, Justin, you can remember, like, there was a point in time where, like, people were choking each other out just so you could pass out. Yeah. And then you would, yep. like, come to at parties. <laughs> like, people were literally yep. choking yep. each other out. And, like, dude, I was one of those people, like, do me, do me. And it's like, dude, looking back, looking back at me. I see oh, that you never some, some good old crossfade in here, um, brother. Yeah, like looking back, I'm like, dude, it's unbelievable that we didn't accidentally kill like one of ourselves, like doing this stupid ass fucking choke out game at parties when I was fucking 16, 17 years old. So I'm like, dude, if I was at a party at, in that that point in my life and somebody was like, I got this fucking embalmed hand, you could talk to ghosts, I'd be like, fuck yes, let's do this right now. So, like, dude. Well, I think completely plausible. Yeah. No, I, uh, what that brings up too is like, I, one of the things I like to, before we get into characters, is like the hand and like the, the whole possession thing is almost like a drug like aspect metaphor, oh, yeah. right? So it's like, it, we've all hit on it so far, but it, it depicts this power of peer pressure in those kind of settings. Mm-hmm. Like, and you said your friend Brian, he's like, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, you're in a fucking crowd of all your friends or people you're trying to be friends with and like, touch the Or hand. people you're like, trying to impress. Yeah, you're like, of yeah. course I'm going to do it. And also, each demon, the directors have said in interviews, corresponded with a sort of mythology Bible, they call it, that they made. So for instance, like each character sees a different spirit, like how the dr- a different drug interacts with you and causes different reactions, right? So I think that this movie subtly really found its home on a commentary on the youth culture of always pushing it to the next thing with a culture of like coolness and who can be the most daring and who can push the envelope the most. Um, But also like Justin, for your story about those kids, like in the theater, like one, that's annoying as fuck because a group of teenagers (laughs) came into my theater too. Here's the other thing with my showing. I went with Jenny and I would say 30 to 40% of our theater was senior citizens. To the point that it made me say to myself, "Am I in the right theater?" Like, is that's a good thing, though. That's that's a great thing. It. That that means that means that means older people are still coming out yeah, for so it was, new original independent horror movies. It was great, but I was like, "Am I in the right movie?" And then it started, and I was like, "Oh, I don't know what's going on." But a group of teenagers came in, and they were shouting and yelling and talking on their phones through half of it. But like, I I feel like I like how this movie uses phones in the sense of like, there's been episodes on here where we all talk about how like modern horror doesn't really depict how people use their phones, right? Or not so much use it, but it's a misuse of phones. Um, But this one showed how ever-present they are in our culture and shows the connectivity they provide, right? So um, the directors have gone on record and said, hey, like, it's kind of shitty that kids grow up in this culture where, like, people can just film them and then things follow them for the rest of their lives. And that's one aspect of it. But I like to think of the parts of it where, like, Mia is looking at Snapchat memories of her and her mom or, like, uh, Riley is falling asleep watching some YouTube commentary and Mia, like, turns his phone off. Like, those are very real, grounded depictions of characters and how they use their technology in the real world so i really liked that but before we move on i also do want to say this couple sat next to jenny and i not even a couple it was a mother and her daughter it was like a uh, a daughter our age shout out to the like, girlfriend shout out to the girlfriend uh but they were like they sat next to us and they looked at jenny and they were like i haven't been to a movie in months and i was like oh boy and there were some scenes in the movie where anytime something happened, this woman would be like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus and Christ. There was a point where something happens that we'll talk about where a character gets some scissors are involved, a character gets them, and the person went, oh my God, <laughs> just in the middle of the theater. And I like could not stop laughing. But 
with that said, getting to the characters, I want to go first here. And I just, like I said, I've been following these directors since this came out, and I've just been kind of like absorbing anything that they talk about because I, I, I think that they have captured lightning in a bottle and they have a really good future uh, ahead of them. Uh, but in an interview, they say that when they were constructing their movie, they wanted it to be an impactful horror movie. And they believed that to do that, it came from a grounded reality with an attachment to characters. So essentially, they needed characters to feel like real people. Real people. I believe that they did that. I feel like they took a gamble in the first act of this movie and instead of focusing on the horror after that opening and really just honed in on Mia and how she is so tied into Jade, her friend's family, and like really built those relationships to get you invested. What do you guys think? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Uh, that's one of the biggest reasons that this movie connected with me so much, like I said earlier, is I gave a shit about these characters. And yeah, that, that first scene in the movie is an attention getter. It's to get you invested in like, holy fuck, like we're in for a ride. Like if this is how they're starting the movie, I can only imagine what the rest of this is going to be. Um, and dude, that first scene in the movie is all one shot. Like, holy shit. Which is wild to think it's extremely impressive. And I immediately noticed that when I was like, Whoa, what are they doing here with this? It was a- absolutely incredible. What a great attention getter. But yeah, I mean, these these characters were, were great. I do have to say one thing about A24 mm-hmm. movies that are just, it's like, come on, man. Can we get one without grief? Can we get one A24 movie where it's not grieving, right? Every fucking A24 movie is like, okay, we're, we're grieving over something. Either we're grieving over a lost one, you know, a lost loved one, or we're grieving over the fact that someone can't have a child, or, like, there's there's just grieving over a family member's death. I feel like that's almost every A24 movie, and it's getting... Not just every, at, not just every in general, A24, in but, dude, I just watched The Fucking Haunted Mansion, and I'm not going to discuss that in full detail now, Disney's new movie that came out last week. That movie's also... Yeah. Uh, you know, centered around Dude, that subject it's, as it's, well. It's getting to a point where it's becoming such a trope that it's like, okay, this isn't this isn't even like a good narrative anymore. It's becoming super lazy. Well, Jeremy, if it's not grief, then it's trauma. trauma. I will. So it's I one, one I, of the two. I will say, in defense of this, even though I'm the one who always defends the tropes of grief. I really do like, and I I fucking knew it too. Watching this movie, I said, "God damn it, Justin and Jeremy are gonna hate how this talks about grief." <laughs> but I uh, hey, hey, I think hey, that the concept hold on now. here. Uh, hold on, I think that the way that they showed grief in here was something different in terms of that they showed that grief in this movie was seen as an open invitation to predatory forces. I, I agree right? with that. So I feel like movie, I feel like with it, in this movie right. it can be spirits, mm. but in our world it can be a relationship with yeah. someone or it can be it can be whatever. So I I do like that. I I, I do well, think that it also, was it was necessary for the way that they played this one out. And the story, yes, and yeah. the story that they yes. wanted to tell. And I think that it, it the way that it circles around to um you know Mia's relationship with her mom and how that played out throughout the rest of the movie and how that kind of latched onto her and led her down the wrong path, if you will. I think it was kind of necessary and it, it did it in a way that was different than what I've seen from, you know, other A24 movies. Not necessarily like vastly different, but I mean, you are correct in saying so, Jeremy. Th- there is grief, there is trauma in all of these movies. And I think, you know, as much of a trope as it is, sometimes it's better to have something that's real world there for people to connect with uh, on on a deeper level. And eventually, I think it'll pass. But for right now, like as long as they do it in a creative fashion and, and it serves the story and the film correctly, like I don't necessarily sure. mind. Yeah. So so let's talk it, about real quick as characters. You know, it's it's a very tight cast. It's a very a tight story, I think, it, and I think it's contained in a way that really helps it. Um, but I think we can all agree the standout is Sophie Wilde's Mia. 
right? And especially through her physical performance, like she goes through this transformation in the movie where at first she's very vibrant, she's very outgoing. You understand that she's celebrating her mom's remembrance day, so there is that concept of grief there. But she still is seen in a car with Riley driving him, listening to see a chandelier and singing it at the top of her lungs. I love that like, scene. And then as the movie Great goes scene. on, she becomes this husk of a person i guess you could say like she is hunched over she's rail thin and while she's that same body type throughout the movie like it's very enunciated towards the end where you're seeing like oh man like something is not right with her and her performance is great but i feel like i found the entire cast to be believable in terms of teenage characters and how they talked and how they acted. And I've seen a lot of comparisons about Sophie to Florence Pugh, another standout actress in modern horror. Um, and I think it's fair. In Midsummer, I, I think it's a fair assessment, but I also think that she brought a different kind of rawness and emotional vulnerability to this movie and character that made it uniquely hers. Um, I think she was really good to tackle this concept of grief. What do you think, Justin? I think... Uh, very well said. Um, she's the reason the movie works as well as it does. I mean, you need a good center character to be able to connect with, root for, and clearly Sophie was the perfect choice to play this part. Um, you know, it, I won't lie to you guys. At first, when the movie started, I was like, oh, shit. I knew it was Australian, but I didn't know I was going to have to deal with accents. Mm -hmm. And um, the theater we were in at AMC, the sound wasn't the best. And I was like, fuck. In this situation, Jeremy would give me shit for this, but man, I wish I had subtitles for this fucking movie. The closed um, captioning. Well, son of a bitch! But Turn them words off! I eventually, Turn the goddamn words off! I eventually got used to it because when my daughter was young, she used to watch all these New Zealand mermaid shows. Oh, my God. And I oh had, yeah. Oh, I nar. Had, oh, nar. Zane Claire! Zane Claire! Oh, nar. So, I had to get used to that. So, I mean, I, I eventually got used to the, the dialogue and, you know, all of that was perfect. Um, the relationships between the teenagers was as real world as I've ever fucking seen in a modern horror Absolutely. movie. I shit you not. I felt like I was watching just like real time, real footage of kids just interacting. You know, the dialogue was absolutely just spot on. And, and all of that, like in, in the way that today's teens interact with one another how they socialize i mean the first party we see you know when they, when they first do the, you know the talk to me ritual it was like it kind of seemed like a lame-ass party but the second they broke that fucking handout everyone got wild and got nuts yeah and it honestly as a viewer got me excited to be there like i was in the room when I say that the movie pulled me in, grabbed me, and held me tight, I mean it in that way where I felt like I was actually in the same room as these characters. The way the film was shot, it was so immersive. And the way all the characters were portrayed by these actors, I was literally like, I felt like I was on the couch sitting next to them. Maybe it helped that there was a bunch of obnoxious teenagers sitting in the theater right down the row for me, but I, I digress. I mean, either way... Um, I think that the character of Mia will, uh, in, in, and I'm not. This is not hyperbole. I'm not trying yeah. to like just push the movie, but I really do think this character will go down in horror history, if not now, in the next few years, as one of the most memorable. Yeah, Jeremy. So like, I don't know, man. Like, you are a big people person, and you're one of the most social people I've ever met. So like, do you feel the characters matched that? energy like they seemed realistic i feel like yeah this is this is one of the greatest depictions of how kids interact uh in the real world for sure like it, nothing seemed like oh this this is some fucking writer asshole that doesn't know how kids talk that doesn't know how kids interact with each other aka rob zombie <laughs> like watch who yeah, watches right. halloween movies and it's like oh it's wild how he thinks teenagers act um this yeah. was not one of those things. Like uh, these writers captured kids and adolescents, and you know, being a teenager perfectly. And I, you know, of course, the go-to is uh, Sophie Wilde's Mia, absolutely iconic performance. But I also want to go with with Joe Bird, who plays Riley. 
Um, oh, he was dude, great. Oh, oh man, yeah. he showstopper uh, dude, performance he as well. Just epitomizes being, you know, a thirteen-year-old kid that wants to hang out with your older siblings, friends, and fit in with them, and like, you know, has a closeness to his older sisters friends but it, he just wants to fit in he wants to be a part of of that um and he's a character that you just he's so lovable he's he's so you know what is it called white eye and bushy tailed like you yep. just want to take yeah, yeah you just want to take care of of that character and the absolute spoiler alert the absolute hell that that character goes through on screen was Fucking just because he wants to be accepted, yeah. man. Just yeah. because he, he wants was terrified to he be was one of the cool kids. Terrified of talking yeah. to me of playing the game, but he's willing to go through with it because he wants to fit in. And like I, dude, I I absolutely uh, sympathize with that. Like I think all of us at some point in our youth do something that we typically wouldn't do. In order to fit just in, for acceptance. For acceptance, dude. Yeah. I went. I went to fucking Mennonite school. You know how much I had to do to try to fit in during that and after that. Turn butter. I mean, <laughs> I mean Brady. <laughs> now look cow. at you now trying to fit in with all the twelve-year-old girls. The fucking yeah, local. Yeah, look mode, at me now. I'm wearing fucking kill ice nine kill shirts. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but no, to your point, Jeremy. There's a moment when Riley, you know, he begs, he begs and begs to allow them to say it's okay for him to play the game. And his sister leaves the room. She's like, no, it's not happening, you know, because her boyfriend fucking made out with an English bulldog, which Dude, I can relate to because I have one at home. That scene um, also, I was like, why, <laughs> why, like, that? I feel like that's, like, that scene went on for so long. I'm like, okay, can we be done with the, the bulldog sticking its dog tongue? No animals were harmed. I mean, my, my bulldogs, they love to lick the face, but I would never stick my tongue uh, out and allow them so to lick it. So I want to talk about that scene <laughs> because it was something that really worked for me, not necessarily the French kissing a bulldog. Brady but... loves watching human boys <laughs> right, make out with English that's bulldogs. That's not true. Let's get the that. The tongue was right uh, in there. But I think... I really liked it because it reminded me of like a Sam Raimi Evil Dead style demonic possession, right? Where like this Mr. I don't like Evil Dead. I movies. like Evil Dead. I don't like Evil Dead too because it's the worst fucking horror movie ever made. Anyways, that's uh, factually incorrect. It's factually and correct. Will, the only I will well, get a you're petition right. The to only prove other you're movie wrong. that's made worse in Brady, horror is Hellraiser. How dare you? How dare How dare, I? How dare you? you? How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Anyways, he's a super Christian boyfriend, Josh, who, like, we've all heard through the whole movie, doesn't even try to kiss her. It's been three months. He doesn't try to have sex with her. And then he becomes possessed in his talk to me seance and he turns into this super horny dude who's like humping the air and moaning and making out with the bulldog like i don't know man like i feel like that's exactly what sam it Raimi was a pretty did. it was a pretty handsome bulldog though it was the bulldog's name I, was cookie by the way it was it was a, it was a great bulldog i said hey that's justin and even jenny looked at me in the movie and said oh justin huh and i said yeah uh but I I really liked that scene. That was a standout scene for me. I do think, though, if I have any qualms with this movie, it's the ending, because I felt like it was a little <sighs> reckless. We're not there. We're not there yet. We're not there. We're yet. we're pretty much at the ending. No, man. we're not. We're not. We're not at the ending. We were just me and Jeremy were just talking about Riley's talk to me experience. Riley was good. All right. So another scene that's if if we can't go to the end, I will talk about another standout scene, and. It was for me when Mia is at the hospital and she thinks that they can, spoiler alert, she can hold the hand and figure out where Riley is. And so she's like, maybe we can save him. They figure out there are spirits that are haunting him, hurting him. So she holds the hand. She meets a little girl spirit who's like, I can take you to him. And then it flashes to this gruesome depiction of Riley just being like devoured and torn apart by demons. And that was the scene for me where I had to look down and like Jeremy said, put my hands over my eyes. Cause I was like, that's too much. Like I cannot, that's that the right scene now. right there, Brady that confirmed to me that the Philip brothers are the 100% perfect choice to helm a brand new version of a nightmare on Elm street. They absolutely yeah. Nail the imagery, the juxtaposition of the real world versus the spirit world, what those two worlds look like, what they feel like, 
the tone of each individual world comparing themselves to one another when you see the shift it's heavy and it works perfectly yes i saw your tweet trying to undermine mine brady i saw it i saw it i'm not blind um i knew you would see it and you didn't like it you know who did (laughs) like it another account that's associated with you yeah, and it talked shit about what you said. Yeah, it did. Um, but no, I think like <laughs> no, what, but, no, just, again, ahead. I'm just I, I have to make this clear though. Not every new filmmaker or new horror movie lends itself in a way where you'd go, those guys would be right, or that filmmaker would be right to do a new Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Uh, Jeremy, I just wanted to ask your I'm opinion. Still, on I'm this still rooting. You are the I'm still expert. rooting for James Wan. I feel like that guy gets nightmare-inducing uh, set pieces and sequences and he really makes iconic big bad guys you know and knows how to work those so James Wan is still my choice for uh, a nightmare uh, reboot however however (sighs) however I feel I feel like these guys would do a, a fucking fantastic job for sure I, 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 I think someone's got to be hungry to tackle that and I'm not going to talk about it forever but I mean a James Wan he probably had that offered to him before. You know, it might have been on the table. You never know. But someone that's hungry and fresh to the game, you know, green, if you will. Well, here's the thing. For that, the- I am no Nightmare on Elm Street fanboy. We've talked about hey, it Hey, no here. shit! I'm, Freddy's I'm, not a nightmare hey, fan! I love the first hey. one. I love a couple of there. But, like, I, for me personally, here's another hot take. I think it's the weakest franchise of the 80s. And uh, you, I... you mispronounced Friday the 13th. Oh, shut the fuck up. You and... actually mispronounced Hellraiser, even though that it's. Oh, even like, though every time I fucking get on this podcast right and say I hate Doug Bradley, you guys are like, <laughs> oh, my God, you hate Doug Bradley. Like, shut the fuck up. Anyways, I think no, I'm not. that I would love to see the Duffer brothers Ooh. do Nightmare on Elm Street. That's, that but would be unique. S- scaling that, back. I, I, scaling already back real quick, I already said Real quick, that. scaling back. I in my tweet I didn't mean that we shouldn't try to herald new directors or people who we think are good but it just feels like every new unique original movie that comes out or something that captures the essence of the 80s everybody's so quick to be like this would be perfect for a this movie Elm this movie here's, Duffer here's Brothers would be though. fantastic but it's funny when, when you mentioned Duffer Brothers I was thinking of uh the fucking guys that made those uh those creep movies on Netflix. Oh, what, what, um, what the, the brothers. Fuck. What, what is their name? Yeah, he played it. He played in the league. He. What was his name? Ah, uh, you said Duff. God. Well, why you guys you said Duffer well, Brothers, and I was, and I out. thought of, of those guys, and I was like, Jesus No, Christ. I know who you're they. They about. were my number one choice after the last season of Stranger oh, Things. Dude. Jeremy, oh, we dude, talked they, about they that would, on our on our review. Dude, the, the most yeah. recent it was the Duplass. The Duplass. Yeah, brothers. there you go. Close. Yeah. Uh, yeah dude. Yeah. Justin, honestly, like yeah, Duffer and Duplass. The most recent season of Stranger Things literally is a remake of it is a Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, just you know, to your point, Brady, I was just gonna say, you know, I would like to see something within the same tone and nature for that franchise moving forward. We know at this point Warner Brothers is not doing anything with it so mm-hmm. or, you know, West Craven's estate or anything like that, so it is what it is. Mm-hmm. But when you see filmmakers kind of hearkening back to that, I mean, it's clearly influenced by it. You can't mistake it in any way. It's there. A group of kids, they're all experiencing the same thing. There's a moment when they're trying to find, you know, the victim's brother from the opening scene. Um, yeah. Duckett's yeah, yeah, brother yeah. or whatever or whatever, whatever his name is. And they're at like a, a bus station or whatever. And I was like, this feels like an Edmund Elm Street movie. You know, it, it felt like all these kids were unique and individual. Uh, and Cole. It was Cole. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, no, I, if it lends itself I, well that way, I'm going to see it that way. I get that. And I don't. Here's the thing. Like, I if they can find a director and a cast to do Nightmare on Elm Street, that's great. But I feel like it almost undercuts when a, there's a new t- directorial debut and they're like the immediate reaction is to be like they should do Nightmare on Elm Street because to me it's like just like give them their thing like let them have it like don't automatically assume like this person would be great for this like we've already seen what a remake of Nightmare on Elm Street does and in the wrong hands it does not do well 
Exactly, but in the right hands, it could be amazing, and that's that's my point. Um, you know, and, and also it will further their career. Uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Well, they already have. They've already signed on to do a um, adaptation of Street Fighter. So I saw that. They're doing that which is, and they all, which is hilarious, isn't to me it? Because the, the, hold on, the, the directors of Talk to Me are doing Street Fighter, yeah. like a live action Street Fighter. <sighs> yeah. The fuck is that going to look like? They also said that they would love to do a sequel to A24 based on how it ends because they feel like it can go in many different directions. So they basically said, like, A24, it's up to you. If you want us to do a sequel, like, well, he said, quote, we'll bloody do it. Like, I would love to see Yeah, that. I feel like I'm I'm down for this to become the next Conjuring franchise because I feel like there's a lot that you can do with... I mean, dude, here's the thing that I, that I really love about Talk To Me is that they don't feel the need to over-explain anything anything it's just here's this hand maybe th- oh i couldn't agree more yeah, couldn't here's agree this more hand this is maybe what it actually is no one actually knows you do these things and you can talk to ghosts and if you say i let you in they can possess you like a party trick and talk to your friends but you have to you have 90 seconds to do it because if they stay longer than 90 seconds they don't want to leave and if they kill you after those 90 seconds, they get to keep you. Like, yep. holy shit. It's so simple, but so brilliant. And in most other horror films, like, they would feel the need to over-explain it, right? Well, here's what this... And here's... It's kind of like the further in the Insidious movies. Like, they go down a rabbit hole of, like, trying to explain what the further is and all these things. No. Well, that's why, Jeremy, that's why A24 rules, because they don't live by those yeah. rules, and they don't... They don't have to require their filmmakers to do that because they're A24 and they want you to think about the movie a little bit. And I think that's why the movie resonates. Yeah, I watched so well. a whole movie called Men with nothing but fucking de- <laughs> dead dick dong, naked you fucking guys that? with big, yeah, you remember big that? British teeth. Yeah. And I still, I'm like, I, I still don't know what that fucking movie was. I don't that know was what his the favorite movie of last fuck year. that movie was. I still don't. But you're going to remember it for so, the rest of your fucking life. Let me ask you guys fucking this, and we'll start with Justin. Sappy-ass, mossy dick swinging. We've talked a lot about what has worked <laughs> in this movie, but was there anything that didn't work for you, Justin? Yes. Yes. Uh, the score. It's non-existent. There's uh, a, have, you, have you looked into that, about like what they've said about that? No, because I don't feel it always necessary to have to research every yeah, little yeah, yeah. bit of a movie. Um, uh, what I base most of my opinions on is just like what I feel experience it. when yeah, I see it. Yeah. Um, and maybe they went for that direction. Maybe you're going to say like they talked about that they wanted to go with you know a lesser score uh, and leave a lot of music out. You know, Cornell Wilzek did the score. Mm. Whenever I post about a movie on especially like Instagram stories or whatever. I try to find the composer's work, whether it's attached to the movie I'm talking about or not, you know, to at least promote them as a musician. Um, and I, I listened to some of, some of their music uh, elsewhere, some of the other stuff they've done, and it was solid. But there's literally like no reoccurring theme that connected with me. And music is very important to me in terms of a movie, and in, in terms of a horror movie especially. So um, that's definitely... My biggest gripe, other than that, I don't really have a gripe. I mean, I feel like, if anything, I would love to champion. There's so many makeup people that worked on this movie that should be celebrated. Um, There's so much amazing makeup in this movie. I mean, they literally think about terrifying fucking monsters, dude. Mm -hmm. Terrifying. Amazing monsters. Amazing. In terms of the score, the only thing that... I found when I was researching the movie was that that was the thing that they had the most difficulty with because um, Michael is very hands-on when it comes to scores and music. And so he described it as like, kind of like you do, Justin, where he's like, hey, like music for me is not something I can describe, but like more of like a feel. So like I know it when I hear it and I know that this should go with this. And so they signed a bunch of people on to compose it. And he was like, they came back with it and it just wasn't working and they were running out of time. So music was the last thing that they had to edit for this movie. And they said that it came down to a point where basically the producer had to come up and be like, look, do you guys want this movie to flop? Like, do you want this movie to like not be successful based on everything else you've done? You just need to fucking figure out the score. And 
So they said that they kind of like worked with the team where Michael would describe what he wanted. They would go for a little bit, come back and give it to him. He said it was almost like Christmas every time they gave it to him, but they ended up coming up with it. But I think that kind of plays into like, I felt the same way. Like the music just wasn't there for me. Like it didn't hit the marks where I needed it. I mean, to. We're, we're comparing it to a hereditary or an it follows. And both of those Correct. movies have brilliant, fucking amazing scores that are so memorable. And I listen to them both all of the fucking time. And it, it's not a huge jab at this movie. It didn't, you know, in the end. Right. Of, yeah. And at the end of the day, it didn't like I didn't walk out and go fuck this movie it didn't have a good score i was extremely impressed i walked out loving the movie i was blown away by it i just think that it could have used a memorable score to accompany the amazing visuals that i got to see sure jeremy what about you I, what didn't work for I, you uh as far as the score goes uh i never once looked at this film and went ah the score bothers me or a lack thereof i was so invested into the characters that i feel like i, I wasn't looking for anything um, and for me, honestly, I think it all just fucking really, really worked for me. I, it I all can't, worked. it all, I can't worked. think of anything that I was like, ah, oh, like, I don't like this. Like, I mean, dude, everything from even a fucking kangaroo that had gotten hit by a car that was dying in, in the street was just absolutely visually, dude, visually. How was that animatronic, dude, man? How was that oh animatronic? Oh, my God, dude. Everything was visually agonizing. Like, I just, every, every fucking thing was just gut-wrenching to me in this movie. And it it made me go, fuck, man, this, this is a horror movie. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me squirm around in my seat. It's brutal. It's scary. I literally don't know what the fuck is going to happen next. Um, I made a post about it, and, and I'll say it again here. For me, once every one, or I'm sorry, usually within 10 years, one to two horror movies really fucking do it for me. And I feel like the last time that a movie got me excited, like, like on this level, it definitely a mix between uh, It Follows, Hereditary, and The Conjuring 2. Like, those three mm. movies... Yeah, I I walked out of the theater and went, "Holy fuck, that is the horror genre that I love," and that's how this movie made me feel. It made me feel reinvigorated. It made me go, "God damn, I love being a horror film." That's what the fuck I'm talking about. That's what this genre is and should be. And it's it's a movie that I've I've been you know standing on a soapbox screaming from the rooftop saying, "Go." fucking see this movie like i think one of the biggest tragedies would be horror fans that hesitate on going to see this in the theater because it was such a fucking experience for me and it's been a long time since i had that experience in a theater so man uh nothing i would change for sure yeah, I uh, I'd agree with Justin. Like, I the score definitely did not hit the marks that I wanted it to, and then the ending, which I can get to now, even though I tried earlier. Um, it just it felt rushed. It felt like a fever dream, but like not necessarily in a positive way, and not so much that it it ruins the whole movie for me. It just it it felt from the moment spoiler alert where Mia picks up Riley in the hospital and starts wheeling him out to the highway and like it's building up to what's going to happen this climax and then it ends abruptly I like that they do that because it it, it puts you in this kind of shocked phase but it felt so different pace wise compared to the rest of the movie that it kind of threw me off in a bad way so I would well, I, Brady much ahead. like much like what she's trying to do is Push him into the traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get the, it. The directors are trying to push you into the climax, and I thought that is honestly is like a thematic thing. Yeah, and I get it. Like it, it, it probably works for a lot of people. For me personally, it just didn't work because I, it, it like I said, it just felt jarring in a way that took away from the ending. Um, but I love the ending 
where she's holding the hand of these random ass people Ugh. and she like you're like all right she's fucking like they got her like the demons the got possibilities her. are endless exactly. now because now they can open this up to the entire world different cultures i mean literally even more so than any other franchise that i've ever fucking seen you're not going to see jason at a lake in you know india or anything you know what i'm saying you're not going to see I, freddy I cougar o- over in japan you could do it but here this movie is legitimately opening up to everything yeah because this hand is something that all cultures would open up to they would like much like jeremy said earlier on you're at a party you're all socializing People like to take chances, social acceptance, yeah. you know, your own deep vulnerabilities inside yourself. Plus, it's that's why this movie is so plus brilliant. It seems like the kids get like a euphoric high after having been yeah. possessed by these spirits. Like once they come back to and the spirit leaves their body, it seems like they almost have like a euphoric high from it. That's so, true. Well, like I said earlier, it's like a drug. Yeah. That's what it is. And there's something to be said about not only the drug aspect that you mentioned earlier on, Brady, but the fact that in our world today, we're always looking for the bigger, better thing. Like, mm-hmm. you know, what what can I do, you know, in my life that's going to be the coolest experience? Like, I've done these drugs. I've jumped out of a fucking plane, you know? Like, this thing would be, like, extremely, like, just right at the forefront for everyone to want to try. It's very accessible, and that's what makes it work. So, given what we've said, what we've talked about, where we're at, Jeremy, talk wanna, to me. I want to start with you. Talk to me like lovers do. Uh, are you trashing it? Are you treasuring it? What are you doing, dude? I love this movie so hard. I love it so hard. Uh, I'm uh, treasuring, treasuring uh, this for the rest of my life. This. This is just something very special, and I'm I'm so thrilled. Like that's literally, I walked out of the, the theater and was just like, "Holy shit!" Like that shook me, that rocked me, that exhilarated me. Uh, I love this movie. I find it so fucking original, and I can't wait to see what these directors do next. So yeah, I'm I'm treasuring this. Fuck yeah, Justin. Uh, Justin hated what's this that movie. Mean? For anybody listening, he thinks that a Nightmare on Elm Street remake would be better. Hey, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> I loved the movie. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll champion this movie for the rest of my life. I, I absolutely was so blown away, impressed by. Uh, I mean, you think about it. Yes, YouTube videos are an entryway into becoming filmmakers, but one would never think, you know, from our viewpoint, I think, Jeremy, you've made a movie, you know, like, it's, it's, you don't liken it to being, like, the same thing, and and, and it it proves me wrong, like, look at what two really fucking talented, connected twin brothers can do um, with a very small budget and just some creativity, and they literally molded together like one of the best horror movies of the last 10 years and that's a feat man that that's literally something that i think even the james wands jeremy attempt to do and sometimes they don't necessarily hit the mark and i think dead silence it's amazing yeah. i mean it, dead silence is fine dead silence is not fine. anymore I'm not talking about that i'm not talking about that um <laughs> but i'm just saying like you know this is one to be celebrated i think by all horror fans, and not just horror fans, all cinephiles, all movie lovers. I mean, the love that this movie's getting is so well-deserved. Um, when I see someone say they didn't get it, you know, I, that's 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 your thing. Like, But I don't understand someone not getting the movie. It's very basic in terms of its themes, its ideas, and what it's trying to convey, and what it's trying to do to you, which is to terrify, which is to make uncomfortable, which is to make scared and the imagery in the movie i mean the cinematography in the movie the characters it has everything that places it on the shelf as a perfect horror movie so i'm gonna treasure this thing forever i can't wait to buy it i can't wait to see it again i'm gonna continue to champion this movie i just have one thing to say a24 stop fucking putting all your merch 
mm. to the same store where their T-shirts are a hundred fucking dollars. I'd love to buy the shorts. I want the hoodie. I want the fucking sweatshirt. I'm not paying five hundred dollars for your merchandise. No, agree. We need to uh, keep talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to. God damn it! I'm, I'm going to. I'm, broke, I'm going to. Man, I live in fucking New England. Like I'm broke as shit when it comes to that merch. Like I gotta buy a five dollar poster that I hope is. I mean, the right he's size. he's buying he's buying a two dollar shirt that was on clearance at the local <laughs> hot topic. The one twelve year old girl didn't want. You know, Shut it's the, the one Ice Nine Kill shirt that they uh, didn't want. They're so. a great band, and they're selling out stadiums right now. So just let me have it. Just wait. Just wait for three years from now. That's what you said three years ago. Look at him now. Uh, anyways, in terms of my review, uh, yeah, like I, I can't not treasure it. I think that. You know, the directors came out and they said that they wanted a movie that could stand alone as a drama or a horror movie. And Justin, you kind of said it in your review too. Like that's what it is. Like you can you can take one of one away from it, and it still functions as a great movie. But I think it fuses them both so incredibly well, and it gives you realistic characters that you can identify with that are grounded, where you see yourself. We can all see our younger versions of ourselves in these characters, trying to do the next thing above our friend, trying to fit in, trying to show why we belong, right? I'm sure we've all done something at a party where we were like, oh, like I wouldn't do that normally, but because everybody else is here, like I'm going to do it. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it also did such a great job of introducing elements of the exorcist which is another movie that's grounded a possession movie grounded in reality they fuse let the right one in that's there the director i think danny also came out and said that he liked um a korean film which i haven't seen but i've heard a lot of good things about by bong joon ho uh memories of a murder it's it's definitely like out there but he said he wanted to bring that korean film vibe to this movie and when they approached producers at first they were like you're not going to get that because like korean culture is different and i think from what i've read they did that like yeah it seems it seems like they nailed that it's actually. just it's lightning in a bottle as jeremy said perfectly and i am so excited to see where they go with it you know and where they go with their careers because they i don't know They've, they've talked a lot about franchise fatigue, and I know we don't like that word, but like that's where we're at as a genre right now. Like We're rehashing old franchises, and we're remaking movies because it makes money. And sure, from a business perspective, that makes sense, but like I want something fresh. I want something original. I want well, we just got it with this movie. Exactly. We got it with this movie. And we got it with this movie. Yeah. I am going to treasure it, and I think that you should spend whatever money you have to go see this movie and even buy the A24 merch, even if it's $500. <laughs> no, don't fucking buy the A24 merch. Prove to them they should lower the prices. No, actually, buy whatever the fuck you want. I don't care. Exactly. Um, well said, Brady. So we're all treasuring this fucking thing. If you haven't seen it in theaters, we just ruined the whole movie for you. So I'm sorry, but yeah, go see it anyways. But if you have seen it, let us know what you think in the comment section of whatever post you're reading this review at, or listening, rather. And, uh, yo, if you're listening to the show for the first time, come say hi. Come on over to our social media, at Epic Film Guys on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Threads, whatever the fuck else is under that. It's everywhere. I don't even know. I can't even count all the things we're under. Um, and if you don't like Brady wearing the Ice Nine Kills shirt and you think that he should give it back to the 12-year-olds, the local hot topic, let us know. I'll take it off on right iTunes. now. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to rip it off like the Hulkster. I'll take it off right now, brother. With his twenty-four inch pythons. I mean, they're like they're not, 20, 23 inches. They're not they're twenty-four. Not, they're not thirty-four. They're not thirty-four. Nah, I, it's um, all right. Let's be realistic. But yeah, yeah. So you can review us on Spotify, iTunes, all that cool stuff. Um, we also have a Patreon, which we're still continuing to work on getting cool content over there for you guys. So check that out, patreon.com slash epicfilmguys. But we thank you once again for listening to this Fresh Fright review of talk to me and we love talking about movies like this championing the horror genre new fresh ideas talk to me like lovers do jesus christ so once again <laughs> oh yeah i'm justin i'm jeremy and i'm bratty 
And as always, <laughs> we'd like to ask you to keep <laughs> your... <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs>